Often, introductory statistics courses do not show the underlying theoretical models when conducting hypothesis tests. Basically, it's just easier to state the assumptions being made. However, as studies become more complex, models become fundamental to drawing appropriate conclusions. This presentation discusses a way to build a model for a two-sample t-test. The next presentation will build models for regression and ANOVA. Then we will compare the underlying statistical models for all three tests. In order to build a model, we're going to use data, and in this case, we're going to use a very simplistic example. We're going to ask the question if brand name batteries or generic batteries last longer. For example, if you needed to purchase batteries for your Xbox remotes, is it worthwhile to spend more money on the brand name batteries? So in this simplistic study, four sets of generic batteries and four sets of brand name batteries were randomly selected from various stores. Then, as you played your Xbox, the number of hours that each set of batteries lasted was recorded. In reality, four observations is clearly not enough to ensure the results will be reliable. We should question whether four sets of batteries is really representative of an entire population. In addition, the remote that you have for your Xbox system may not be consistent with all others. However, to keep the mathematics from cluttering the key concepts, we will use this very simplistic and somewhat unrealistic example. We will use this data now to create a statistical model. Statistical models typically have the following form. There is an observed value that is equal to some mean response or some expected value plus random error. The observed value is simply the observed response data. So we take our observed data and put it into the first column. Now we will take this observed data and break it up into two groups. The true population mean, the mean response, and the random error. We assume that the population of all generic batteries has some constant value that represents the overall mean, the same for brand name batteries. In addition, every set of batteries has some natural variation. Some batteries just last longer than others, even if they're from the same brand. Statisticians typically make the model more inclusive, so instead of using mu g for the generic group, we use a 1 to represent the first group and 2 to represent the second group. Certainly, generic could be mu2 and brand could be mu1, but the point is we're just using numbers instead of letters so that it could represent any potential set of two groups of data. We can now use symbols to represent every specific response value. The first subscript in the observed response represents which group it comes from. The second subscript represents the observation from within each group. So you notice in this case, we have four observations in the first group and four observations in the second group. Often, we can write this more generally, just saying our observed responses are y, i, j, where i is 1 or 2 and j is 1, 2, 3, or 4. In this example, each group has four observations, so j goes from 1 to 4. In some studies, there is not an equal number of observations in each group. We can use n sub i to represent the size of each one of our groups. One key issue that we always need to consider when creating a statistical model is the difference between parameters and statistics. We don't know the parameters, the true mean response from the entire population, or the real error term. So instead of using the actual population mean, we are going to use the statistic y bar, which is the mean calculated from our data, also called the sample mean. We place the sample means, the y bars from each group, into the appropriate sections of the mean response to demonstrate that each observation comes from a group with a particular estimated mean value. The first four observations came from the generic group, which had an estimated mean of 80. The second four came from the brand name group, which had an estimated mean of 85. The last part of our model is the residuals, or the estimated error terms. We often use the Greek letter epsilon to represent these error terms. Residuals are simply the observed values minus the expected mean values. Using the same subscript notation, the first residual from the first group is simply y11 minus the mean of the first group. The residual from the second group is simply y12, or 82 in this case, minus the mean of the first group, giving us a value of 2. The third residual from the second group is y23, in this case, 95, the third observation from the second group, minus the mean of the second group, and gives us a value of 10. After calculating the rest of the residual values, we have three completed columns. 
In reality, the columns simply represent eight distinct equations. These equations can be written with numbers, as you see here, or they can be written with symbols. However, writing out every single observation and the entire set of eight equations can be rather tedious. However, as we said before, this example is not very realistic. We often have many, many more observations. So we certainly don't want to take the time to write out every single observation. So we make these eight equations more concise by writing one statistical model. Note that we just looked at four different ways to look at exactly the same data model for this problem. All of these models are algebraically equivalent and can be written any of these ways, but we typically prefer the model that can just be written on one line instead of using eight lines. In addition to creating a statistical model based on our sample data, we can also create theoretical models that use population parameters. Both have the same structure, However, one uses sample statistics, means and residuals calculated from our actual sample of data, and the other uses population parameters.